totaled the vehicle, totaled him. You know, his toe was in his hip, oh, so his my. knee had completely gone no. all the way around. You know, multiple broken ribs, broken back, everything you can think of, right, chunk out of his head. <laughs> Jay, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks for having me on, Dodge. Yeah, mate, good to have you on here. Let's go back all the way back a little bit. Um, what made you choose the military and how old were you? Uh, so I went in the military when I was 19. Um, and I guess it was, uh, there's a few reasons really. One was I never never really enjoyed school or got energy from school, found it quite boring. Um, didn't really like being stuck indoors, mm. stuck in classrooms, found, found, the lessons and the teachers probably uninspiring and it's weird looking at it now a lot of the subjects that i found boring i'm really interested in yeah. like geography history yeah, yeah, yeah. i think it's because it's not forced down your neck yeah when it's forced down your neck you kind of push it away yeah. uh, and i'm an active guy probably probably mm. like you enjoyed sport enjoyed pe yeah um so when i left i went on to go to college uh to study sport which again enjoyed playing sport but just didn't enjoy the, the coursework yeah, and, and the man. work that came with it. Yeah, mate. Yeah. So um, dropped out of college and just went into a series of pretty dead-end jobs, yeah. um, making windows, working in a factory. Um, and I had a friend that was in the military, and I always wanted to join the military from being in, in, in school. I wanted to join in the, uh, the Royal Marines. Mm. So he used to come back on leave. We used to chat, and he used to tell me the stories of what he'd been up to and – uh, it was something that, you know, I always wanted to do it. And I guess he affirmed what the military was about. Yeah. And for a 19-year-old kid who probably doesn't have any direction or purpose, yeah. um, it was the perfect thing for me to go into. Mm. And what did, how, how does it actually work going into the military? Do you choose a regiment? What, what's the next step for you? So, so I, I always wanted to join the Marines. Yeah. Didn't for whatever reason. Um, it was actually... <laughs> Funny, funny, funny story. Do you remember the the advert? The ninety nine point nine percent need not apply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was the worst. So, so that actually was like the worst mistake that the Marines ever did because no one applied. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're trying to do a double double bluff. Yeah, and I was I was probably one of those guys. I was like, I'm definitely not that point one percent quality. So I yeah, I had a friend. He went in the paras, and uh, you go into your army careers office and apply for it. And um, so luckily. My mate that was in the paras was basically told me when you go in, they'll try and get you to join up the local regiment or yeah. a, a different regiment. Stick to your guns and just say you want to join the paras. Yeah. So I went in, naive little kid. Yeah. He put some videos on on a on a video yeah. cassette and sat and watched those. He tried to convince me to go into another regiment. Right. Okay. Um, said you know you can play sport. You get you get fed you all get this. Sold. You get, you get sold. You get sold a dream. Yeah, <laughs> you do, literally. Yeah. Um, you know I played rugby league at the time, so he's like, you go play rugby league and go box. You travel all around yeah. the world. Uh, never played any of it when yeah. I joined. It's <laughs> like right, you know, two years in, run operations. Uh, so you were, so you were, you were, that was up north, was it, or did you have to move somewhere, or was that? Were you yeah, based I was up Preston. There? You were Preston, okay. Uh, but then I was based in Colchester, where oh, the parachute okay. regiment are based. And how long were you in the parachute regiment for? Four years. Four years, and yeah. and, and and what what do you do in the parachute regiment? Um, so their primary job is an airborne assault force. So if you think that the Marines and the Paras are probably the two biggest yep. or two best units in the British Army, yep. um, the Marines basically look after things that are, are offshore, yep. so anything in the sea. Yep. Paras are onshore. Okay. Uh, and the idea is that you've got the regular infantry will fight a battle up to a, a flot, so a forward line of enemy troops. Yep. Um, and then the Paras job is to fly in in an aeroplane jump out and land behind that flot and oh, quality. disrupt and disturb that area okay um obviously that's that's the primary job but yep. then operations dictate what you actually do on the ground right. so for me i joined went to iraq that was when oh wow post iraq war that was when what year are we talking here in iraq 2000 and so i joined 2004 2005 i was in iraq so you so you were in iraq as a 20 year old kid yeah but that wasn't too bad. Right, okay. That was three months. It's quite um, young, right? 20 years old to all of a sudden find yourself in Iraq. Yeah, Afghanistan was probably the biggest learner. Really? Yeah, we... So Iraq was dying down. We did three months in Iraq, which was... And you say it was dying down. Dying down from what? The war. The war going the on there. The Gulf. Yeah, and you were going in there to protect... 
yeah. or to um, look after or to what were you going in there for it's more just but it's like a show of force or boots on the ground you've okay. got a specific task okay um trying to think what ours was because i was quite young at the time so i didn't you you leave the training depot as a, a parachute regiment soldier yeah but i guess you don't really understand what happens strategically until yeah. you've been in quite a bit yeah um I'm trying to think what we did. We just got big in the gym. Yeah. <laughs> Happy days getting paid <laughs> we again. Like, we yeah. got the big lumps. <laughs> we had this, um, yeah, literally just at food, training Quality. the gym. <laughs> Sounds um, good. Yeah. <laughs> There's a swimming pool out there, so we're chilling the swimming pool. Uh, but we were going out on the ground and doing stuff, but nothing really happened. Okay. Um, and so that was in Iraq, but then that yeah. changed when you, did you have to come back and then they flew you back to Afghanistan? Yeah. So I think the Americans looked at going back to Afghanistan in 2005 or 2006. Yeah. We obviously supported them. Yeah. We were in Iraq in 2005 when we got the, the call that the Americans are going to go back in, we're yeah. going to support them. Um, and it was, yeah, it was three para that went over there in 2006. So wow. I want to say it was less than six months later from coming back from Iraq. We had okay. Christmas leave. Um, and then I want to say it was probably March that we deployed out to Afghanistan in 2006. Jesus. And uh, did you get a, did you get a buzz from it? When you flew back, back to Colchester, you were like, yeah, or were you like, get me back to, get me out there again or get me to Afghanistan. Were you sort of that age where you were just like, bring it on? Or was there nerves or fear? I don't, I, I don't know. I'll probably say in the middle. I was yeah. never, I was never buzzing to get back out there. Yeah. And I know definitely that second Afghan tour, I felt quite sad leaving because yeah. of what had happened on the first Afghan tour. What happened um, on the first Afghan tour? It was just a lot of fighting. Um, so we went out there to, you know, the reason was to to provide security for Afghanistan so that we can help rebuild it. Oh, okay. So it was a peacekeeping mission at the start. Okay. So we went over there in soft posture. So we were wearing um, thin body armor. Yeah. We had floppy hats on instead yeah. of helmets. Yeah. Not expecting that anything would kick off. Um, and then literally the first job that we went out on in Nauzad came off the back of the helicopters and you could just hear that was like the first time that I'd heard fire. A, yeah, a round coming your Jesus. way, sort of cracking a thump. It's, it sounds like a crack wow. going over your head and then you hear the, the impact. Of Is that when hits. reality kicked in for you? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a wake-up call, isn't it? Because yeah. <laughs> we weren't expecting that. Yeah. We weren't expecting it to be so so kinetic. And um yeah, we did that day in Nauzad and that was you know, that was that was fun, right? You yeah. get off with your mates and yeah. you're all like part of a team and we had a really close knit family, like the pl platoon that we had at that time. And was how many so how close. many sort of numbers are you looking in a platoon? Uh so probably around twenty five. So it's twenty five type blokes. Yeah. All Split looking after down each into, other. into four three sections yeah um each section's got a section commander um and then you've got like a platoon sergeant ours was dan dan jarvie who's this big jock yeah strong yeah, yeah, like yeah. jock guy that used to fish hook you and really yeah <laughs> nose <laughs> like grab your face and <laughs> nose blow you and stuff there's <laughs> always one of them in a rugby <laughs> yeah. team as well oh mate his fingers he's <laughs> yeah, just yeah, getting yeah. his finger oh, and you're like ah. it's normally it's normally a number six or a seven is it in a, in a rugby yeah, yeah yeah, yeah. So then, so you're out in Afghan. How long were you out there for on your first tour? I was six you months. call it a tour. Is yeah, that what you yeah. call it a tour? Yeah. yeah, that was six months. Six months. Uh, but that was, um, like I said, you know, that now was the first experience that, that we rolled into. And then uh, we deployed to a place called Sangin, which is, which is, I don't know if it still is, but at the height of Afghanistan, that was the, the worst place to go. Okay. Um, and you were and deployed we, there? Yeah, we deployed there for three months, pretty much, or pretty much the whole tour, three to four months. Jesus. Um, and at the time we went out there because the, the, the governor was getting accused of uh, touching kids up. Really? Yeah. And wow. the locals were turning against him. We moved into his house and uh, set up this, this base. What, so you took over his house? Pretty much. Really? Yeah. Quality. I mean, it's not a nice <laughs> house though. <laughs> I mean, no, yeah, 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 yeah. But we, we took over the area around his house and uh, set up like a little base yeah. and dug some trenches and stuff like that. And okay. Then, Just um, the 25 you still? Was there more men? So we took... We took attachments, so we took a machine gun attachment, uh, so heavy machine guns, uh, mortar attachment, so we, we bedded some mortars in. Wow. Um, and then, like medics, we took uh, some intelligence guys, um, yeah, and, and just basically built a, a HQ out of this wow. governor's building. And did that make the locals feel comfortable? Or were there still locals not happy you were there? Was it hostile? It's hard to say, right? Yeah. Because you can't go and ask these people yeah, now and speak. you can't sit down on a podcast yeah. and say hey guys like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be, that'd be a good podcast that would be, wouldn't it? it that would be good um it's, it's hard to say right like whether we did good or, or, or bad mm. um 
you know hand on heart every, every one of the soldiers that went out wanted to do good right we want to yeah. go to a, a place and, and make it better for the yeah. people that live there you know that comes with frictions yeah. frictions generally end up in firefights and yeah. gunfights that's, that's going to piss locals off yeah 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 um you know our intentions were, were good right we wanted to change this place and make it a better place mm. to live in but um yeah you end up scrapping and we, yeah, we blew half the town up and wow um and how long were you out there for six months in total. six months yeah. and then you come back again to colchester yeah i came back to colchester and then you pretty much because that was the heyday of afghanistan right that was the first tour that that that, that brits had been on that yeah. was kinetics and yeah. say the falklands yeah okay um and that was that was pretty much my life then for every two years you'd deploy out for six months wow um so you know four or five more afghanistans and then went into some other stuff and then bloody left hell. bloody hell that's madness isn't it yeah wild so then you were like so you were in the paras for four years four years so what's the next <clears> step <throat> up from paras sas special forces and what, did you always have that in your mind that when you're in the paras you think i, I want to be the next up i want to be the the king i want to be the an sas a little bit yeah. i mean i was quite naive in the whole military sense a lot of guys join the military and they know everything about each regiment and they know all the history yeah. and they've watched documentaries and movies and yeah. I'm probably completely the opposite. Just went in because it felt good to go in. Mm. Um, and it was similar to the SAS. Didn't really know much about it. Mm. Hadn't read any books. Um, spoke to a few guys. So you've got like guys that have been on selection that mm. come back and they tell you the stories. Okay. Of, and they're the heroes, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. come back as the heroes yeah. because they've been on selection. When in reality, they didn't pass right okay <laughs> but they're the they're the all wise ones that have done are they the ones in the pubs that tell you they're in the SAS yeah, yeah. I've heard those probably yeah, 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 yeah. dodge yeah. dodge yeah, I was in the SAS oh really what do you have to do I, 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 I do a bit of digging and find out they actually weren't yeah they're the worst right <laughs> yeah. they're all over the place they though. are waltz yeah there's a lot down here <laughs> probably is there is so opposite one so <laughs> <laughs> actually biggest, I, biggest I was in I was in the SAS as well <laughs> yeah. but <laughs> qualities tell me about the training what did you have to do you said right uh, do you have to do you have to fill out a form and say i want to be in the ss or do they go you know what you would make a great candidate for the ss what how does that what, how does it work so i'd gone out on that second tour of afghanistan in 2008 and at the time we the sbs were, were stationed out in the same place we were yeah. and we used to see them fly out on, on on jobs all the time and um they've got a different aura about them yeah I mean, it might be the same in, in rugby when you see a national side or yeah. you see a Premier Premier League side. They act, they act differently. They yeah. look differently. Yeah. They've got better kit. Yeah. Um, they get paid better money. Yeah. Um, well, it's like a it's like a Premiership player going to play for England. Yeah. Or an England player going to then play for the, the British Lions. Mm -hmm. I guess that's kind of the step up, is it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, they've got this kudos about them, which you're instantly drawn to, right? Yeah. You want to be a part of that. Yeah, I bet. And then you've got a so when i when i went on selection you've almost got a you you apply for it right you go and tell whoever's in charge of you your platoon sergeant and, yeah. and your boss that you want to go on selection mm. and if you're a complete muppet then they'll probably tell you not to waste yeah. your time yeah. but um we'd all come back with that 2008 tour which was quite a quiet benign tour there wasn't really much fighting that happened on it um and we'd we'd come from this 2006 tour was scrapping all the yeah, time, and then yeah, yeah, did this yeah. 2008 tour, and it was quiet. Peace. And we were getting sent on these jobs where we just dug holes and made right, positions, okay. and nothing happened. Okay. Um, was that better, or do you prefer the 2006 scrapping? Prefer 2006, yeah, yeah, hands down. <laughs> yeah, quality. it comes with its compromises, yeah. right? But you know, we had a we had a good time. That was yeah. like one of my best tours. Yeah. Um, and the 2008 one was just bought. But yeah, boring. boring. I say boring. Yeah. And was that time for you to say, right, I want to go into the SAS? What is the what is the training like? What have you got to do to become signed off or a beret and a belt to be to say, well done, you are now in the SAS? So it's a six month selection process. Yeah. Um. So yeah, you, you you apply for it. So you're all volunteers, and it's broken down into. So you've got a, a three week hills package, which is. Um, Sounds like a holiday, three a three week pa package, <laughs> <laughs> a three week hills package. Well, it kind of is. You get all your food paid for, right. you oh, yeah, all your accommodation, days. you can eat all inclusive. You <laughs> <laughs> He's got to cover thirty kilometers every day with a load of kit. On is your that butt, right? Pretty much, yeah. So for three weeks, you're camping. No, so you stay in a camp. Yep. 
Um, and then you're off in the Brecon Beacons. Yeah. Um, Penny Fan. Yeah, that's one of the yeah, yeah Penny Fan, and um, so you start off doing what are called DS led marches, where you'll go out with a DS or an instructor. What's a DS? Directing staff. Directing so okay. he's an instructor. Yep. Uh, so he's already badged. He's in the SAS. Yep. We call it badged when you okay. get. Okay. Um, and he'll take you out on the hills. You've got to prove that you can map breed, and everyone takes a leg, and you're out in a big group, and you probably do. 20 kilometers come back in and then you build up on that so you, you might go out and do 20k one day might go out and do 15k 30k okay so you're building up your level of fitness yep. the the weight increases in your rucksack yeah you have some what are called bee stins mm. so dicky bow wood's a classic one what's that um it's a it's a wood in the shape of a dicky bow yeah and it's basically a massive hill so you just the, the, the instructors all come in at the same time at the bottom. You know what's going to go on, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> they just send you up to the top of this hill, come back down, send you up again, come oh, back down. God. It's just that for yeah. half a day. Um, which, <laughs> surprisingly, <laughs> wow. no one really comes off unless they injure themselves. Yeah. It's, it's hard, right? Yeah. But you know you what you're head doing. on, haven't you? You've got to go, right, I'm going to nail this. Yeah. yeah. But you get, say, you probably get about 150 applicants. Mm. Um, and then after that first three-week period, you're probably down to about 50. Oh wow! But a lot of them, so you, will, get rid, you get rid of the, the yeah. weak, the weak ones. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of them will just, a lot of them just, I feel because I've never been in that mindset of I'll bring myself off. Yeah. And I feel a lot of them, it just you plant a seed. So that dicky bow bow wood might be a seed. Yeah. Right. Get in thrashed. I don't want to do that again. Yeah. And then they'll go back that night, go to bed, and give up. Yeah. Yeah. They'll just think about it. Yeah. They'll think of going back and seeing the girlfriend yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. having some warm food yeah. and not have to get up at 5 a.m. Yeah. In, the, in the pissing rain. Mm. And That's the same as entrepreneurship as well in business. It's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot of people come up with ideas and want to do it and they find it difficult and they just go, oh, Jesus, I can't do this. Yeah. And then dip out. Yeah. yeah. Probably 99% of people. Wow. That's interesting. So then that was, so you're on a six month, uh, you're doing a six month and that first three weeks was that yeah, first three weeks yep. is <clears throat> first three weeks of the hills, um, and then it finishes with the last week is test week. So you have a series of marches, yep. which are you've got to complete them in a certain time, um, and they're classic marches that everyone knows what they are. They're, they're set routes that the SAS have, have been using as marches yep. since since the dawn of time, kind of thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's there's five marches. You, you're allowed one red flag, so you're allowed allowed to fail one and then what is that done on time yeah time okay so you might get i don't know six hours to do to do one if you come <laughs> under that six hours you, you, you okay that's your red flag okay and then you've got you finish on endurance so you come back in you come back in around 12 o'clock or no, about two o'clock in the afternoon and then at eight o'clock that night you go back out on endurance which is 66 kilometers so 40 miles uh, and you get 20 hours and it's about you're carrying about about 70 pounds 70 pounds what's that so, 30 kg yeah on your so, back yeah wow food load of emergency kit wow a rubber weapon <laughs> um yeah <laughs> <laughs> they'd not be that type of rubber weapon <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> have batteries in it <laughs> quality just spins around <laughs> <laughs> That'd be better. Quality. Quality. I'm going to be losing it. It would be losing. We get a luminous guys, ones. Yeah, guys, can you hand your rubber weapons? <laughs> <Yeah. in? laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, and then, so if you pass, so everyone who gets to endurance generally yeah. finishes it, finishes endurance because it's not that hard, but it's just constant. Not that hard. So you're talking 60, 60 kilometers with 30 kg on your back. Yeah, but if you've, if you've passed everything else up to then yeah. or had one red card, you don't then throw it away for this one that's because okay. it's it's slower. It's it's one k an hour slower. Yeah. Um, and then you you basically come back from that. You 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 know your legs are all screwed. I remember. Yeah. Um, and we're coming back and you get the weekend off before you start some comms training and yeah. your ankles are like yeah, massive. And I went went home at the time and my mum made me go and get an X ray because she thought I was Lost I broke my ankles. Yeah. Um, but yeah, your feet are all pretty messed up. And then you come back and you got to a week off or a week doing comms training and then you go out to the jungle of brunei is that right how long yeah, for six weeks wow and that's that scene as the the hard yeah, part okay if you can get past the hills yeah so you get you know 150 people start the hills yeah. you might have 50 
that then go into the jungle. You might have 30, you might have 20, depends. Wow. And then the jungle filters the Tell rest of the Tell me what you did the in dross. the jungle. Um, so the, the jungle is probably one of the hardest environments to operate in. Yeah. Because of its humidity levels, it's con- you know you're constantly sweating, you're yeah. constantly wet. Yeah, you've got you know insects that are just sucking blood out of yeah. you, and you know you're waking up with leeches on your lips, and wow. um, it's just hard living. How long? How long are you in the jungle for? <clears throat> Six weeks. Six weeks in the jungle, and you're camping out every night. So you do two weeks where you're um, doing a, a build-up package. Yeah. So you live in a camp. Um, you go. Uh, you go out and do a lot of range work, mm. so you get ready for doing the ranges when you go in the jungle, because the the ranges in the jungle are all um, really. G- this is the first time you'll shoot so close to other people in yeah. such um, confined spaces, because there's a lot of rules and regulations in the military. Yeah. So if you're in in the normal, if you're in the paras when you go go to a range, yeah. you can't get away with as much as you can when you're in the special forces. Okay. So we'll shoot. Oh, I see. Okay. Because you want to get to a stage yeah. right when you're in the units where you're going through pitch black rooms you know some of these buildings that are built for training yeah. have it's a maze when you get inside it's it's a load of you know small box rooms and it's all pitch black it's all oh, done really? on a set of night vision goggles oh wow um and you're you know huddled up as a team with live live ammunition shooting targets all live all live oh my god wow yeah so you've got to be able to trust each other yeah. with, with guns cuz um you know, it's quite easy yeah. to, be able to just pop one into someone's back. Absolutely. So, so there was, tw- so there was fifty going out to the jungle. Yeah, yeah. So we had about fifty, and then you get rid of maybe half of those. Maybe what, a so, bit so more. within that period, some of them go, "I can't be doing this. Get me yeah. out." Or does the DS say, "You're not strong enough, mate. You've you've got to move." Usually, on. take the take the cells off. Take the cells because you can. That's the pu- that's okay. the beauty of selection. Okay. At any point, you can take yourself off. Yeah. And that's probably one of the hardest things of it. Yeah. Is that if it's hard and you're having a shit day. Yeah. You're just like, right, yeah. I want to come off. Yeah. So what was your mindset when you were out there? Um, For me, it was... Were you stubborn? Um, or were you just like, I'm determined, or like, you know what, I'm getting through this, I'm going to nail this. Like, I, I'm not someone who, who, who pulls myself off for any reason. Like, I've, ne- I've never been like that. And whether that's stupidity yeah. or... I just... I'm just not someone who wants to pull himself yeah. off. So the thought of VWing for me, yeah, never an option. Yeah. And you find there's a there's a the people who are generally there at the end all thought and felt the same way because we you end up gravitating towards the same kind of people that you are yeah and we you know in my little group or clique we never once talked about coming off or no one talked about VWing or it was right what's VWing uh, voluntary withdrawal so just take yourself off so we we come back in from being on the ranges and everyone you know you fucked it's like the the most tired you've ever been physically drained physically dehydrated yeah. um and you know that when you get back in you clean your weapon that's the first thing yeah. you do uh and then you eat yeah so as soon as we get back in right lads let's get the weapons out get cracking clean yeah. the weapons because that's that's the first thing you do yeah. and then we eat um and you you, you create this little group of people yeah, that amazing. are all doing the same thing and then you, s- you see the other ones right you see it's the, you know you see the the f- the weakness just come out of them and and, and they take themselves off. Yeah. How um, much? How much trust and loyalty do you build up with your boys? Loads. Mm. On selection, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's it's six months of solid graft. It's beasting. Yeah. Yeah. In some of the, you know, yeah, it's fucking hard. Yeah. It I enjoyed it. it though. I'm getting drained. Listen to how hard it is. <laughs> I'm just picturing what I'd be like. In wow, wow, hats off. Yeah, the jungles, the, the jungles hard. Like you know, I wish I took a picture of myself when I finished. A lot of lads did, yeah. but. You know, you, you must have lost a lot. You must have been ripped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you get that. You get this weird. You get this weird little fat belly, yeah. and skinny arms kind yeah, of body. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're eating. Fat. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get it now. If I do the climbing, yeah. you, you don't come back shredded. You just have this little, little this little podgy bottom, belly. You can't there. get rid of. Yeah, and skinny noodles. That's like you get into your forties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so you moved on from the jungle. Did you come back from the jungle thinking, right, I'm a quarter of the way through this? So. The, the jungle is is seen as probably the last testing right, phase. Okay, kind of is, kind of is. So they're really mentally testing you here as well, are they? It's almost like the jungle's the hardest part. Yeah. So whoever gets to the end of the jungle, generally they're going to be stood at the end of of selection. Yeah. Um, because that's the last phase of people coming off. Yeah. Because after that, it it doesn't get easier. 
But after that, everyone that passes the jungle will be able to pass everything else. Yeah. And then you do, um, what do you do after? You do escape and evasion, which is, um, so you basically go on what's called the run. So yeah. you, you're basically learning how to, when you go overseas, if you if the job goes wrong and you end up on your own, and you have to leg it yeah. and go through, you know, a, a, a system that you go through. Wow. Um, and you end up getting captured. Uh, you know, th- there's a big chance that you're going to be tortured and um, you're going to have to do, you know, videos. And there's all this, this, wow. okay. this protocol. So you get okay. taught um, basically what could happen to you if you're okay. captured. So you, you get set off on, on day one. Mm. And you Where are like, you? What country are you in at the moment? So this is England. It's all so in England. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we had, you know, it's six days where you get given really basic equipment, yeah. 24 hours worth of food, and they set you off and you've basically got, you start, say, here yeah. in the south of wherever, yeah. and you've got to get to a location that's, say, 100 kilometers north. Okay. And you've got five days to work your way through this landscape, okay. meeting up with certain people on the way. Um, so you, you're trying to escape a hunter force which is trying to track you okay um so you you move at night time and then sleep during the day wow and you pretty much do <laughs> you pretty much do everything you can to not get caught to not get caught to it's weird because you know we did ours it was november time so it was raining it's yeah. cold brutal <laughs> and you've got you know you've no warm kit it's just as in you, you know you're setting off as if you're on the run yeah so did you get caught uh no Good. but then <laughs> so you set off in a, in, a, in, a, in a group so we were a group of six and did you have to land do you have to get to your destination as a group of six you don't have to right you can get but, there on your own but you want to look after your pals uh yeah you, it was yeah but you're trying own. to you're trying to escape these so the guys that were, were tracking us were two para and they're all like you know they can't wait to find you right they're, okay they've got dogs they've got all sorts oh okay right? okay um and i know that if i was in that tracking team you'd really want to yeah absolutely <laughs> fuck yeah yeah fucking right. <laughs> you do don't you <laughs> absolutely <It's> like, um <laughs> so obviously if you start getting lazy yeah you know that so if you start taking roads footpaths yeah. all that kind of stuff that's where they'll be waiting for you yeah um and we <laughs> we were moving through this nighttime location and um there's like a big you know welsh lake over to the to the right and we just thought you know fuck it let's just go on this road <laughs> and, uh, we're all like walking down on this road and all of a sudden this torchlight just shines over the top of this oh, hill no. so we all just go into this long grass yeah. and everyone crouches down yeah this is like day three yeah you, you know you fucking boots Knackered. a piss wet yeah, through yeah, yeah. and um this torchlight comes over and i can i can see it start getting closer and closer and closer <laughs> and it just comes on to us and everyone's just like oh, hey. no. I think it was me. I just fucking jumped up and leg. I've never run so really? hard in my life. Yeah, because if you get caught, you go into the what's called the bag or the pen, which is um, you get thrown in, in an interrogation situation for okay. six hours or whatever it is. Is that when they play like put a bag over your head and they play yeah, babies crying and you get that at the end, but you basically get all your food and clothing taken off you, so it just ends up being worse than what oh. it should be, and oh. then thrown out in the middle of nowhere and expected oh. to. So yeah, we all legged it, and I remember. I didn't know this, but one of the lads ran straight into the water and started swimming. So swam to the <laughs> other end of this ice cold water. He didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> who was that? Who was the guy with the torch? So probably one of the one the of the. Four, one oh, of the you don't know. Yeah, it's probably like a farmer or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> we all just like it's a robber. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I remember just I've never sprinted so hard in yeah, my life over these we call them babies' heads. Yeah. Um, like in fields, these big things of grass. Yeah. I just sprinted and sprinted, and then I I was on my own then. Um, and you've got this comm system with you. And for the next day, I was trying my hardest to find this this mast, uh, an antenna mast, and I thought I'd found it. And um, there was some hunter force in the area. And like, I literally, you know, came close to getting caught. Like yeah. I remember at one stage, I was stood next to a tree and two two guys just walked out in front of me, you know, and they were 20, 20 meters, oh. yeah, maybe 10 meters. I could hear him talking. Oh. And I was just, I, this is, you know, the point where you just don't move, right? Yeah. Because yeah. if you move, they'll yeah, see they'll movement. Yeah. yeah. So I've stood next to this tree, just like staring at them. Oh no! I, had, I don't know whether they saw me and took pity, pity on me. Yeah. But I didn't see them look over, yeah. and they just carried on walking. And then I was convinced that I was in the wrong place, but it was an antenna. Yeah. So I, I started trying to find this other antenna, and it was a antenna in the m- middle of a field with. Do like you know a, where you were in the country at this point? Wales. 
Was it Wales? Was yeah, it? and you've got these trees going around this antenna, and I stood there and I was like, right, this is the place. And it started going dark. And I got up on this comm system. I was like, is anybody out there? <laughs> Help. I sent about four or five messages coming going, yes. yes I'm at it. the antenna. So we all met up, made this little fire and had, a, oh, of course had some hot food and stuff. Happy days. Yeah. And then so, so when that finishes, when you finish that, what's the next step? Um, is that your final bit? So yeah, then you obviously go into interrogation at the end of that, which is... Talk me through interrogation. Which is 36 hours of, um, yeah, just getting interrogated. So that's, you know, if you... That's the um, stress positions and then being... Example of a stress position? Um... So cross-legged on the floor with your hands on your head. Oh, that's one. They don't sound too bad. No, right? no, no, no. That's painful. I'm yeah. just about cross my legs on the floor. Let alone yeah. my hands. It sounds easy, but it's it's and, not. And a lot of guys are like that, right? Yeah. A lot of guys yeah. are sports guys yeah. and stuff. Um, the other one is just stood leaning up against the wall with your hands up, which again doesn't sound too bad. But um, and what sort of time are you looking? How, are they just saying, "I just stay there until we're ready." I mean, you don't know time. You don't know time, time gets taken away from you. Wow. Like sight gets taken away from you. Um, so you don't really know where you are. Um, and they'll stick you on a wall that's got water dripping down it, so you've got this water just just being a down nuisance your hands. on you. Yeah, just, oh. <laughs> just things like that that yeah. just wear you down yeah. as a, an individual. And, and then, what was your mindset when you're in there? I'm going to nail this. Yeah, because you, you you've been on the run for six weeks, yeah. uh, six days, sorry. Yeah, um, and you've got to this point now. Yeah. You've passed everything yeah. so far. So in my head, it's, it's fake, right? Yeah, it's fake. It's made up. Yeah, doesn't mean that it's not hard. Yeah, but no one's gonna no one's gonna shoot me. Yeah, no one's gonna rape me or yeah. do anything that they say yeah. they're going to do yeah. um so i was just like right use and abuse it because you have to if you get captured you've got a you've got a you know you could your last meal might not have been for a long time mm. um so you've got to play it you know play that player play that card of you know please not me like yeah. can i just have some more food yeah. and, th and you know they're humans as well yeah. they'll reward you and i was getting like but he's stuffed in my mouth yeah. and sweets and hot. <laughs> but like, you've got to do that, right? Because yeah. I've, I've literally had eaten 24 hours worth of food over the last week. Yeah. Um, and then in my mind, I'm just like, do you know what? It's, it's the last 36 hours. Yeah. Just get it done. Get it, but get you, done. you know, by that point, you're hallucinating. Yeah, I yeah. bet. Um, they've got this, this uh, when you're in the stress positions, there's uh, music that's played. Yeah. And it's, at the time, it was Middle Eastern music. Oh. <laughs> and... <laughs> I could hear voices in this music. Yeah, I bet. I could hear my parents speaking yeah, to me. Yeah. I could hear people say my name in this music. And um, at the end, you, you sit down with your main interrogator. He throws a blueberry muffin your way and a hot cup of tea. This is after it's finished. Right. And you go through a debrief. And um, he was like, how long do you think that music was? I was like, it went on forever. Yeah. And it's a one minute 30 loop. Just oh, playing the same oh, thing over and man. over again. How painful is that? Yeah. But yeah, you go through a series of interrogation scenarios and whether it be soft, you know, someone being friendly with you and mm. talking to you like we are now yeah. or someone mm. throwing, you know, hot drink in your face yeah. and pushing you up against the yeah, wall yeah, kind yeah. of thing. And then what? When you finish that, then what, what happens? Do they, um, do they, what, how do you become, the, you know, you're now in the SAS? Do you celebrate? Is it anything, you know, what do you get given? It's a bit of an anticlimax. It is, is it? Yeah, you get... So you, you've got another two training training phases after that. Yep. So you go and do a counterterrorism phase, which is shooting and stuff like that, and then you do. Whoa, 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 whoa! Let's bring that back. Shooting, <laughs> shooting what? Shooting who? Uh, so just training, because you shoot shoot differently in the, in the special forces than you do in in the regular army. What's the difference between shooting the special forces or regular army? So in a regular army, you don't really have to be a good shot. Yeah. Because the kind of jobs that you're going out to do is covering big areas of land. Yep. Okay. Um, I mean, you could say that, you know, in Afghanistan, that was a bit different. Um, the special forces world is more um, going to people's houses, you know, fight, you know, getting them in, in, in their building, in their compound. Oh, so you've okay. got to be able to fight in tight spaces, yeah. especially, you know, you've got to be able to take shots, lethal shots at, you know, a close range or, you know, you've got to be able to take a standing shot of 50 meters. Okay. Uh, headshot like moving targets wow. all that kind of stuff so wow. you've got to you know we train quite hard that's you know if you think of a special forces soldier his primary job is to be a shooter yes everything else is secondary yeah um so we drill that quite heavy um so that we're able to to carry out those shots in an 
you know when someone's shooting at you you can stand in a doorway and take a target down right, okay. in minimal amount of time okay. and then you've got to think you know you've got stoppage drills so if you go to shoot your rifle and your rifle doesn't fire you've got to be able to sling it pull out a pistol and shoot pull right, out okay. a pistol headshot in wow. the same amount of time wow so that you get taught that and that's just a lot of repetition yeah just a lot of shooting um and then learning room combat so learning how to you know neutralize or destroy targets within a, a building what's a, a full-on fight man on man yeah i mean you don't want it to be a fight oh no i mean that that's the that's the last yeah, thing lot, right yeah. that you want if you've got if you've got machine yeah. gun and pistols and stuff well you yeah. don't want to fight do no, you? it's like no. you know if you think of um you know some of the more dangerous situations you just want it to be over in a yeah. minimal amount of time yeah. so you have to be fast and mm. cautious and fight from doorways and Definitely. yeah it's a different game right shooting yeah. people in in buildings than it is this is this is fascinating to hear all of this it really is yeah. and then what so when do you actually get given the your, your badge what so yeah you, given? Is it a you do the, the, those two and then uh so at the end of the six months you go away you do some parachuting and then um yeah, you come back, we all came back and went out on the piss, Quality. as you do. As you do. We all knew we'd passed. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and then we all had a stinking hangover. I had to get up, do this computer test the next day, and they just called you up and they're like, right, be at the, the clock tower at 11 o'clock for the picture, and you go down to the clock tower at 11 o'clock. They give you a belt and beret, salute you, whatever, take and that's the picture. It. And then they're like, see you later, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this, th this group that you'd just yeah. you know been a part of for the yeah. last six months, and you'd formed some of the tightest friendships and relationships with you'd have to wave goodbye to him and the next day you turn up at your squadron and troop what's you're been. back to the paratroopers now you go back to nah, your, that's you you never was, you never, never go, go back. back okay never go so back where do you go to now then so you're in hereford now yeah. you're, you're you're at the camp the sas yeah. camp yeah um the pictures at the clock tower yeah and then literally the next day um so i met my tl my my, my uh, team leader yeah next day you turn up in the office at nine o'clock and meet the lads and yeah that's so now you're all sticking now together. You, now you, you've gone from so you know all the the rest of the guys are selection they all just go go to their go to their teams yeah um whether it be sbs or SAS. Oh, okay okay and there was three of us that went to uh my squadron at the time um so yeah like i'm the only guy in the troops so i just went and met the troops so you've gone from being like almost the big dog on selection yeah. getting to the end of the selection and then yeah. you just go and meet all these guys that are your team members that and i was young i was 24 years old they wow. were all they were all there was one other guy that was he was two years older than me and then the rest of them were in the 40s right okay so they're they've all been big they've all been around the block yeah all done like multiple tours of iraq wow. and you so there hear must, all these so, stories so basically and, when you go into the ss there must be hierarchy again yeah yeah it's okay. a rank structure it is yeah and did you so, work your way up yeah after so you, the 10 years is it like the top dog how does it work or so do you have to go through certain steps so when you join the sas yeah you give up your rank in in the in the normal military so yeah. i was a lance corporal when i went on the on selection yeah and then you become a trooper which is a private soldier which is the lowest rank um and then you every two years you you get promoted naturally so you go private soldier to lance corporal to corporal to sergeant yeah after six years and then you kind of sit around and wait for a promotion up to staff sergeant yeah which could take three, four years, and then you go up to sergeant major, and then you can go into being an officer if you want to be an officer. Okay. But that's, you know, you're talking, I got up to the rank of a sergeant after 10 years, um, and my next role would have been team leader of a troop okay. if I hadn't got out. Okay. And how does it get, how does the pay structure work? Do you, as you're going up, do the government pay you more money as you're going up? Yeah, you, you get, so this is like one of the biggest plus sides to being in the special forces. Yeah you get instantly a way better pay um you get something called sf pay which is special forces pay yeah um and then yeah you you promote every two years naturally so you get a pay rise every two years mm. you get a secondary pay rise every three years which is your sf pay um and then when you go overseas you've got a load of bonuses and okay you spend you know you spend a lot of time away mm. whether it be training um whether it be on operations whether it be standing by for operations so you're generally not in the uk yeah and you're generally not in hereford yeah so you you know the pay the pay is quite good for yeah. you know 24 year old to 30 year old guy yeah. who's yeah. spending a lot of time away where food's paid for where mm. accommodations mm. paid for um you know he's no gym membership because there's a gym everywhere mm. he goes you're all inclusive 
all inclusive <laughs> see it is there all inclusive go. package <laughs> <laughs> quality and then and, and so you were in there for 10 years what made you made you the decision to go right it's time for me to move on there's a few reasons um yeah there's a few reasons i think i think the one of the, the biggest one for me was freedom yeah and just having my own freedom and owning it where you never had that in the military even in the special forces you're always told where to be yeah you're always told what to do what to wear what kit to bring yeah. um and don't get me wrong it was the best job yeah. that i've ever had but there was something inside of me that just wanted that freedom yeah. and wanted my wanted f to be able to be in charge of what i do and yeah. where i go and towards the end of it I, you know i got into the climbing stuff and um was lucky enough to go over to germany to train to be a mountain guide mm. um, and i guess it was there that i started seeing that there was more to do yeah. in the world yeah um and that kind of planted the seed for me I, I got out maybe four years after doing that mountain guides course okay what year um, are we talking here when you left i left 2018 in august oh wow so i've only been okay. out two years oh okay and um, then yeah operationally i felt like i was gifted in a way with yeah. operations i joined at the height of afghanistan yeah. and we had a good time you know when i went to the went to the sas we had a good time in afghanistan yeah. and then that starts to close down and yeah different operations open up which yeah. aren't as exciting yeah. um i felt like i'd done a lot of You've done your time what i wanted to do and as well y you know the longer you stay in the more you end up sat behind a computer yeah okay or teaching yeah which again wasn't something that i wanted to do it's yeah. going backwards for me yeah you get paid more you've got more responsibility but mm. i kind of enjoyed it in my first two years yeah, where yeah. your responsibility is ladder man yeah or yeah, 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 yeah you know you, you just a a shooter and a stack yeah. you just gotta you know go through that door or, or yeah you know you're a medic that's yeah. it it's like zero responsibility it's funny isn't it you look back whether even it's in business or or ss people always say it was never as good as it used to be and it's kind of that sort of mindset of it's time to move on mm. you know because they're asking you to do tasks you never wanted to do anymore in my view so when you decided to leave what was the first thing you did when you left you get a pension by the way yeah and that's <clears throat> that's done for life yeah i mean I left after 14 years, so I got okay. what's known as half pension. Yeah. If you stay in for uh, 22 years or 24 years, you get a full pension, okay. which is active as soon as you leave. Okay. So I get it's not it's not bad considering yeah. I did 14 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I get like a payout when I'm 55. I got payout when I left. I got payout when I'm 55. Okay. Um, when I'm 60. Is it 60, 67 yeah, or 60? Yeah, someone keeps going well, up and yeah, up, doesn't not, it? To be honest, I just... <laughs> I don't pay I'm attention. Like, yeah. Hopefully, I'll get to that age. <laughs> I don't need a pension, I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> so then, what was, the, what was the move when you left? You're like, right, I'm out of here now. What was, the, what was that transition like from being in the Special Forces and then going into civilian life? Was that difficult yeah, for you? Yeah, weird. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, people say it's very probably very close to people, you know, retiring from sport. Yeah. Um, you know that was your job for the last 14 years yeah. that, or 10 years yeah 14 years um especially coming out of the sas where um you part of this this close-knit team of people that are all thinking and feeling and doing the same things yeah. and you know the, the piss taking yeah and, yeah, yeah. Um, it's you know, the just, best bit isn't it yeah walking into <laughs> yeah. walking into the hangar of the office in the morning and yeah there's there's, there's lads around that you can always chat to and yeah. it's, it's a family right yeah you'll go for go for a coffee at 10 sounds very similar to rugby boys rugby do you know legs. what after reading so similar yeah after reading like dylan's and yeah and haskell's book yeah it's exactly the exactly same. the same initiations yeah like, all, all the piss taking yeah. all, the, all the banter it's exactly, yeah. the same. exactly the same but it's the same job right mm. you both put your body and life on the line and it can be very violent very whether it's violent. on the pitch or whether it's yeah. in training every day but you're with the boys every day taking the piss and having a laugh and all of a sudden that's taken away from you how did you actually feel that first sort of month um i'd be lying if i didn't say i felt a little bit lost yeah i would be i'm very forward thinking and forward my momentum's always yeah. forward so i never look at it as a negative but mm. um yeah, that first, you know, the first month I'd gone from being in, you know, that squadron with that group of guys and uh, yeah, I'd gone from that. I I basically left. So the normal route to leave the military, you give 12 months notice. Okay. So you, you 
during that 12 months you can do all the courses it's called yeah. resettlement yeah. so you can do courses you can go okay. away and re-educate you sit on your ass mm. do whatever mm. um and then you leave after that 12 months whereas i wanted to get out quite quickly so i get so i had six weeks what you said to hand your notice and say i want to get out in six yeah. weeks okay and they they honored that that's nice of them um so i'd gone from like working yeah the, the solid job and then six weeks later handing my id card out wow. driving out that camp and I was sat in a London flat, two bed London flat. Just staring at the walls. Just thinking, oh, just thinking, uh, I don't know. It's a new challenge, of right? Course, but of there's, course. there's a, there's a period where you, you have to make an adjustment from being Jay in the SAS yeah. to Jay as a, as a civvy or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is there, is there uh, a lot of support with mental health leaving the uh, special forces? Yeah, the support if you if you if you want it or need it. Yeah. Um, there never was, I think. There never was support. There was, but I, d I don't think we. Do you know, I joined two thousand and four. Yeah. I know that that two thousand and six tour there, there was a lot of issues when we came back. There's probably still some going on now. Yeah. yeah. Um. You know, we all came back, got absolutely shit faced and put all the windows through in the in the block it's yeah. one of those kind of things yeah. lads just wanted to and and then you saw lads just hit the booze right yeah. Yeah. just spent all the money that they saved on yeah. tour on the booze and yeah. um and back then it was you know that there hadn't been that much fighting mm. so the mental health thing was very new well no one knew about mental health until it's only yeah. blown up the last two three four years really yeah due to social media and everything yeah so so now there's a lot of support in place um, it's, it's, I find the mental, mental health thing, you know, it's, for men especially, it's a hard thing to talk about, yeah. right? Especially people that have suffered with it. Yeah, it's generally. I know that, you know, we'd get briefs or talks about mental health whilst we were still serving, and it was you get figures of guys that are actually seeing people for help and how successful that yeah. is, and you know, you don't know anything about it because men can be very secretive yeah. with that kind of stuff. Yeah. For you know, rightly so, right? You're living in a yeah a high alpha environment of, of guys that might see that weakness. As a, a negative or yeah. a weakness yeah. when it's actually not it's not no it's not it's not i wish it was called mind health yeah the yeah, mental health got mental such a bad bad yeah i wish it was just called mind health and i think a lot more men would open up but the word mental growing up as a kid in the playground if you said you know it doesn't link very well yeah. in my opinion on that yeah uh, and yeah i, ca I completely agree because mm. at the end it's simple right yeah it's you saw a load of shit your body and brain's reacting to it. Yeah. You're not going to be the same that you were before you saw that shit. Yeah. That's going to take some adjustment period before yeah. you start to feel normal. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And I wish, you know, I suffered a little bit whilst I was serving. Mm. Um, and again, I didn't go and see anyone, mm. but you, you understand that that's what it is, right? It's my body just a, and brain just adjusting to yeah. a different environment that I was operating. Was that PTSD? In. Um, I'd say if you labelled it, yeah, yeah, PTSD. Yeah. But um I'd say it was just more more that, right? It was just an adjustment that I had to make. Mm. It's basically you've seen shit that you don't want to keep in your mind. Or are you happy to keep it in your mind and you just put it deep up you put, yeah. put it to your side essentially. I, th I think for me it was um so you become massively desensitized yeah. when you when you're serving. Um naturally, right? Yeah. You, you, the things that you do. Um you have an ability in your mind to be able to switch that yeah. off. And I think that translate into, translates into a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So you end up switching off a lot of emotion, a lot of, um, which is still there, right? Yeah. So you switch it all off. So when you come back home and you speak to your girlfriend, yeah. you, you struggle You struggle yeah. to communicate with them, right? Yeah. Yeah. And at the time I um, I was on a busy, a busy task. Um, so we were going out, we dismantled a full IED network, which was, they make, they make these explosive bombs. Um, IED stands for improvised explosive device so they make these homemade bombs um, and there was a, a network which was say a gang yeah um, operating in a certain area that we dismantled and took down um, which was a busy three months doing yeah. that it was we were doing back-to-back -back jobs at the same time as training this this what country is this Afghan Afghan again and then um, I had a chance to fly back in 24 hours instead of doing so when you fly back from operations, you have a period of three days where you sit in Cyprus and decompress. Okay. So you, you go through the period of, right, that was work. Now we chill out right, and then okay. we go back to our families. Okay, okay. 
um, and I didn't have that. I just flew back in 24 hours and right. I'd literally come off a job. I'd come off a ba- like three back-to-back jobs, um, jumped in a helicopter, flew back, jumped in a plane, flew back, landed in the UK. Jesus. And I'd still had that switch yeah. off in the head, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah. I was like, right, I'm in this place. <laughs> I shouldn't be feeling the yeah. way I feel. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I'm used to feeling like that in, in Afghanistan or yeah. wherever. Yeah. But I was feeling like this blue skies and birds tweeting. Yeah. And that was for me that was a weird that was a feeling inside me it was just like what is just going like, on yeah, yeah. I d- couldn't really understand it but knew that i felt didn't feel right and i was on the train up north to, to see an ex-girlfriend and you just can't f- put together everything at the time wow it's, it's a weird no feeling. one knows what you've just gone through and what you've just no. seen and 24 hours later you're back in london <clears throat> getting a train up to up north yeah trying to go for dinner with my ex just like, <laughs> sat down just like i don't know why you picked an ex <laughs> <laughs> That's a double whammy, isn't it? <laughs> she was an ex. Oh, yeah, you yeah. <laughs> She is now. She is now. <laughs> Quality. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, you don't know who to talk to, right? Yeah. You don't know. I couldn't speak to any of the lads. They yeah. were all still over, over on Ops. Yeah. Um, so you just got to deal with it. And mm. I found probably I was drinking a bit too much because mm. that helped with it. Um whether it helps it in the long run, I don't, no. I don't know. I wouldn't, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say it was a negative and it didn't turn into turn into a yeah. problem, but it definitely made me feel a little bit better for that yeah. brief period. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, two weeks later, I was fine. Yeah. Still fine now. Still <laughs> <laughs> With that little twitch going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so when did you, I, I want to know about climbing Mount Everest. How on earth do you go around about climbing Mount Everest? What was the idea behind it? How much did it cost to do? And how long did it take? So the, the op- it was an opportunity that came up whilst I was s- still serving. Yeah. Um, and I specialised in, so I was mountain troop, so specialised in the mountains, lucky enough to go and um, become a mountain guide yep. over in Germany. Um, and then came back and there was a, an ex-regiment guy, John, who'd been, uh, so he was involved in an incident in Afghanistan where a helicopter had landed on a vehicle that he was sat in. Yeah. Totaled the vehicle, totaled him, you know, his toe was in his hip. Oh, so his mate. knee had completely gone no. all the way around. You know, multiple broken ribs, broken back, everything you could think of, mm. right? Chunk out of his head. Mm. Um, gone through gone through his rehab. Ended up setting a, a, a business up. Yeah. Um, doing really well. Yeah. Successful, yeah. made his money. And then he was in a position where he just wanted to do, you know, stuff that he wanted to do. Yeah, good um, for him. And K2, which is another mountain, which yeah. is the second highest mountain in the world, he wanted to climb K2. So, so Mount Everest is in Nepal. Yeah. K2 is where? Uh, between Pakistan and China. Okay. It's in the same mountain range. Okay. The Himalayas is the highest okay. mountain range in the world. Okay. So he put, he basically asked the regiment if they wanted to put anyone on this expedition. I put my name forward and, um, yeah, devised the training plan because John had never done any climbing. Yeah. So, you know, we went up to the Lake District, we went out to Chamonix in France, um, and then we ended up on a mountain called Manasli, which is the eighth highest in the world, okay. which is also in Nepal, Yeah. Um, which we failed on miserably, and John nearly died. But, um, whoa, whoa, we, whoa, 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 <laughs> just rewind that. John nearly died, how? Yeah, we just, we, we made a load of mistakes going into okay. this mountain. It was the first 8,000 that we climbed, and how many feet is that is that 29 30,000 feet yeah about that okay about 20 26 okay 27 okay just the two of you just the two of us okay so we'd, we'd gone to climb this mountain and uh we flew out way too late um you get a six-week window to climb an 8 thousander. yeah and that so in that six weeks you've got to walk to the mountain to the base camp which is a height difference of maybe you know four thousand five thousand meters in altitude so you do that slowly to okay. acclimatize because yeah, the yeah. body can only acclimatize to 500 meters at yeah. a time. Um, you then stay for a period at base camp and then do an acclimatization leg where you go up to a, an altitude of around 7,000 meters, come back down, and then your body can produce red blood so cells. You're going up another 7,000 to come back down. Yeah, and then you give your body time because <laughs> <laughs> you want to you, you want to you shock your body. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. So your body starts producing red blood cells. Okay. So you're able to take on more oxygen because there's less higher up. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you then look for a weather window when you can summit the mountain. So we basically gave ourselves three weeks, so flew out too late, 
um I actually went out to Bali for three. Yeah, I had the, <laughs> I, had, I had the six weeks off, booked yeah. it in with the, the sergeant major. Yeah, and uh, John was like, "I can't fly out till three weeks later." I was like, "Just don't tell anyone, mate." I yeah, got yeah. to <laughs> Bali for three weeks. Pina coladas, swimming yeah. pool, chicks everywhere. <laughs> oh, no one even knew. To no. this day, there's one guy that knows in the whole squad. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, I flew back from Bali, and then we had three weeks to climb this mountain. You know, that six week period is there for a reason yeah. to let your body adjust and yeah. produce the red blood cells. We didn't, and we, we flew, we helicoptered in straight to base camp or yeah. just below base camp. John was having these massive like headaches and migraines. We, we took it easy, but we basically rushed everything. Um, got John up to camp two on a, on a summit push. He looked like he was gonna die. Wow. Um, got stuck in a snowstorm. Um, and I'd, for some reason, decided to pack light because I didn't think that we'd, so I took the amount of food that I thought we needed for the days that would be out yeah um which when we were stuck in a, a tent at camp two we yeah there's so much that went wrong we our tents were up at camp three we got stuck at camp two in tent so we were living in these two-man tents with these germans that had luckily taken us in as orphans yeah it was it was a mi miserable few days we were sat in this tent it was hammering it down with snow we basically fucked up on it and i'd eaten all my food and Oh, John wasn't man. acclimatizing and I wasn't really. And then we set off after this massive snowstorm. Um, basically, avalanche triggers at a certain angle of yeah. slope, yeah. which this mountain Manaslu has loads of them. Yeah. So we're <clears throat> we set off out after camp two, all fatigued, all knackered, because you don't sleep up there because mm. um, the body just can't rest as well. And um, we're going over all this avalanche prone terrain, and um, we got up to say just below camp four and we saw a couple of avalanches happen and oh, they're the biggest killers in the mountain yeah absolutely so we just i just grabbed john and turned around and just said no we're not we're let's not. go back yeah wow um so what, you, what are you thinking when you're sitting in a two-man tent shivering and it's what's going through your head you think i could actually die here no that was just miserable well, okay it's a food thing right yeah 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 you, we sat for t sat for two days in this snowstorm no food no food oh mate like one one or two meals a day wow. like literally no one meal a day yeah, yeah less than that yeah like a bit of the scraps from from what the germans had i was just yeah i mean you you want to get high right you've got that you you've got that drive to get to the summit mm. um all sorts of things must trigger in your mind though surely yeah i need to get out of here alive but I've, one. It's, it's, you don't like the you don't feel danger until it creeps upon you right okay so yeah you've probably quite vulnerable where you sat but um you know being in a tent at camp two there's not much that can happen yeah okay um you can get bogged in maybe um it's further up i think the avalanches were a bit more like yeah. the old yeah you know yeah I bet. five pence twenty yeah, pence yeah, started yeah, going yeah, 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 I bet. um i turned around to one of the sherpas i was like ming where i was like avalanche he's like yeah, yeah i was like oh, and these this, this german team who were more experienced than us were you know they were charging up there and i don't know you get lured into that false sense mm. of security that what they're doing it with yeah with, with, yeah okay yeah they know what they're doing yeah. so um we'll, we'll follow those guys and Ideal. yeah it was when the, the slope started slipping away under oh, us we're mate. just like no let's get out of here <laughs> <laughs> get me home. Yeah, that was quite that was coming down was quite scary because yeah. i had john is it harder to come it. down than it is go up yeah it's a pain it's a pain in the ass it, yeah like everest right so that summit how, many days. how many how long does it take from the bottom of everest to get to the top of everest seven days okay set so, and back down okay that's when you're fully acclimatized okay. so it's, it's six weeks again so same as manaslu yeah yep. um so you do all your you, you walk to base camp acclimatize yep. go up to seven thousand meters come, come down. back down yeah. get, your red <laughs> get your red blood cells pack more food <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and go again yeah. <laughs> we actually tried on that last so it's summited last year we um we, tr we tried to do a, a sneaky little attack and there was a few lads that were quite strong in the group so yeah. we, we tried to summit early and um yeah didn't make it but you basically leave base camp and it's seven days to the top and back but the the summit push the summit day mm. um you're at camp three which is seven thousand three hundred meters and you you get there and you sleep and then you wake up at 5 a.m pack all your stuff up and then you set off at 5 a.m get to camp four for 4 p.m yeah. sleep till 7 p.m mm. leave at 8 p.m 
summit for say we summited at six seven in the morning and wow. then you come all the way back down to camp two and i got back to camp two around nine o'clock at night oh. so it's a good 40 hours of wow so just to, just when you get to the summit what do you see how do you feel and there's like a pint of guinness at the top waiting <laughs> for you or something <laughs> is there anything up there nothing <laughs> no. so what's the it's feeling like when you've actually achieved it again it was that that first time was quite an anti-climax yeah because you get i got to the top it was great getting to the top yeah. i felt strong I, f yeah. I didn't feel fatigued or knackered yeah. i didn't feel like i'd stressed myself a lot to get to the summit mm. so when i stood on the top i was like you could be stood on a, any patch of yeah. land anywhere in the world yeah. there's nothing that like everest doesn't feel the same doesn't feel any different than standing on a hill in yeah. scotland yeah this is it's, it's a patch of of land um there's like some flags and and poles and stuff okay. that have been hit into the in, into the snow um but yeah it's quite an anticlimax. how many people die trying to get to the top of mount everest and did you ever see any dead bodies on your journey yeah yeah you see quite a lot that second so last year there was quite a few few dead bodies the first time wasn't that bad um i actually met up with with a couple of the lads this weekend and we're, we're laughing about it i stood on some dead guy's hand did you <laughs> yeah <laughs> jesus but um yeah we saw that so last year we saw quite quite um quite a lot it was so when we when we left so there's quite a few getting brought down quite a few westerners getting brought down mm. whilst we were going up from from camp three um and then when we left camp four it was like a horror film yeah so we we started climbing and the sherpas were bringing down clients that had tried to summit the day before yeah. that were like wacko yeah. so one of them i think was already dead if not on his way yeah um so they've got two sherpas so it's a hill yeah there's two sherpas stood like up the hill and they've got ropes coming from the harnesses to right. the body right and then there's one sherpa trying to navigate him wow but they were bringing this guy down and his head was just like whacking off the back of these rocks on the way down and the next this woman that came down behind him was screaming oh. at the top of her voice and he's getting this is a few guys that hadn't been up there before and everyone was like looking at everyone going it was on it was pitch black Jesus. just got a head torch so you're looking at these like looking at this woman screaming oh, and dragged man. down by these dark <laughs> figures i was like it's like a horror film did you get paid to do this <laughs> no. <laughs> no and then <laughs> as you're going up there's so there was a body that had fallen um on the way up from camp four to the balcony yeah and he was still on the rope so you've got a you clipped onto a line that's yeah. a safety line or whatever so as you come up to him you've got a he's like you've got this ascender device called a jumar that's still on the rope with his hand attached to it <laughs> so you've got to unclip where his hand is oh, no. and then reclip round him and like walk around him and i think his hand was like this and i just remember standing on this squidgy thing and my mate was like you're on his hand i was like ah. oh no <laughs> <laughs> and it, what, what amazes me I've, I've i uh read that you've done it twice yeah was the first time easy or the second time first time first time easy. yeah i think for no is that because it's the unknown i don't know you know i think i just felt stronger on that first that first summit push um i, I don't know whether i you know my preparation my fitness going mm. into it food I, I don't know yeah um might not have caught you know you, you generally catch something when you're in yeah. in nepal whether it be like a bacterial bug yeah you don't really know about it right your body just sorts it out but you you generally come back with something um the second time was i was looking after a group of clients so there was more 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 responsibility which comes with its own stress because mm. everyone pays you know going back yeah. to the money it's it's roughly around 32 average is around 50 50 euro, 50 thousand us dollars what's that 30 grand sterling yeah 30 40. what if someone wants to go to the top of mount everest cost them 30 grand yeah wow easy and then can you pay more for you can pay up to say 150 thousand us uh, dollars uh, and what do you get for 100 grand sterling from for 30 grand to 100 you get just nicer conditions you get probably better staff I'm so thinking, you get i'm thinking completely different luxuries to you here between <laughs> 30 grand under grand <laughs> you want that rubber weapon yeah? <laughs> bring it back yeah. you get a rubber weapon on yeah, your bed yeah. <laughs> now you go up and there's there's you know their camp there'll be like a massive one of those glamping massive dome tents. Tent, oh, yeah, okay, okay. With like sheepskin rugs and, oh, okay. and whatever, and PlayStations. Like a, and like a VVIP. Night. Yeah, and the food's package. better, and the, they've got beers. Yeah, and, okay. Um, you know, they've got each an, an individual tent. Now we're talking. In. Yeah. Now we're talking, Jay. Sheepskin rugs. <laughs> and, 
Uh, but it, you know, once you leave base camp and the luxuries of base camp, yeah. it all it's all pretty much the same when you yeah, get higher okay. up. You all sleep in a two man tent. Yeah. Um, and you, then you've got to take your own equipment, right? And it's just as it's just as hard. But yeah. you're probably guaranteed that you know some of the the higher end guiding companies, and um, they'll guarantee that, that that you summit or come back down alive. Yeah. Uh, and they've got like a hundred percent hit okay. rate on that. Okay. So move, moving on to uh, the TV program SAS, Who Dares Wins. How did that all come about? Um, how did it? So I, you know, left uh, left the military, set up through dark a clothing brand with a couple of couple of SBS lads. Yeah. And then at the time, the producers got in touch with with us um, to provide clothing for the show. And at the same time, just you know, just said, look, we're looking for this new storyline. For a for a mall, yeah. Um, th- are you guys interested? Um, at the time, yeah, it was a bit of a no-brainer. We yeah, just all, all applied for it, and uh, yeah, I got the short straw. Yeah. And how did you how did you feel leading up to that? Was there any nerves? Was there any fear? Was there any sleepless nights about going on to a show? Probably all. It was, was it? Yeah, I think more. Um, coming out of the SAS, going on TV is not what's done right okay you know we we signed the official secrets act um you know which bounds us not to talk about certain things yeah. and um tv is or media is yeah. an outlet to to, to break that, yeah. that 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 act that you sign yeah. um so it's you know ever since andy mcnab got out and rip bravo to zero yeah. and chris ryan had written his stories um, was that seen as bad back then? Yeah. It was, was it? Yeah, okay. massive. It still is. It's still okay. frowned upon, right, to go out and write a book about an operation you've been on. Right. And there's been other books since leaving. Yeah. Um, there was one about the operation in Iraq that we went on to. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's it's not a natural progression from being in the SAS to being on TV. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, talking about the identity that I had, I was still, you know, in that my headspace you know still chatted to the lads in, on camp and you know i had a good reputation and yeah. you know i was trusted and um you know a, a lot of that comes with a, a lot of weight on your shoulders yeah. and for them you know i knew that as soon as i got accepted to go on the tv show that the tv producers would then speak to to to, to hereford to the sas and you know i was kind of waiting for the yeah. response which yeah, I'm not gonna lie. It was quite stressful when yeah, you've got, I bet. you know, your old sergeant major or whatever phoning you up saying what you're doing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Because um, you built that trust and that relationship yeah, up absolutely. for so long, and now, you know, I I knew that I was never doing anything wrong, right? I knew that I wasn't breaking any rules, or I'd never bring the regiment into any bad yeah. light. I still won't, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah that's you know you're insular right you're mm. in this you're in this group in the sas and that's it's like the, the classic thing right if everyone if everyone thinks that blacks are shit color then everyone generally yeah. thinks thinks that blacks are shit yeah. color it's yeah. um did so you have any everyone, phone calls to any of the boys saying what you're doing or was, did you find yeah. you kind of like a, a few a f- messages that came out yeah, okay. i think they're worse right yeah of course it is it's phone call i can explain myself yeah, yeah. um and then it, 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 quite a weird thing happened i think after a few of those messages came through um like i was on holiday at the time in portugal mm. did the old thing you know went straight to the bar i was yeah. like forget it yeah 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 um and then some i started getting messages of off lads that i wouldn't even see him as mates yeah. whilst i was serving it's a close family right everyone knows everyone yeah um and you stop and chat to people but people that generally weren't my mates were messaging me and saying Jay heard about the show. Don't listen to what everyone's saying yeah, back good. here, mate. It's a good thing. Yeah, good. Um, good that it's you, kind of thing. Yeah. You're, you're doing well. Um, and yeah, you know, I still speak to lads on camp now. And um, I think after they saw me on the show and they saw that it's probably not as bad as what everyone makes mm. out in camp. It's, Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I loved it. Did you? Yeah, it was good fun. Yeah. And you enjoy being the mole, and then they pulled you out, and then you were at, oh, then you were. Yeah, the mole was mole was shit. Was this? <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> And they pulled you out. I just did it for 14 years. Yeah, for you. <laughs> I don't want to go back on as like 35 year old man. <laughs> Get shouted at by yeah, 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 aunt yeah. and whatever. Yeah. Um, how long were you? How long were you? How long were you a, a mole for? Six days. Six days. And then how long were you? How long Four days. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you moved on to uh, writing a, a book. Respect is earned. Mm-hmm. How long did that take you to write? 
from about start to finish, all the stories and probably about eight months. Yeah. Uh, which is quite good because we had lockdown, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Lockdown's been good for a lot of things, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that probably took about seven months, mm. which was yeah, interesting. Mm. It was good to revisit my life going from start to finish. Yeah. Um, again, you know, I'd never thought yeah. leaving in August 2018 that yeah. I'd, be, I'd be writing a book. Yeah, amazing. Mm. Look, massive respect for doing that. And did you find that it was a nice feeling to get everything out of your mind in a brain dump and go, it's in the book? Obviously not everything, because mm. we can't play everything, but was it a nice feeling to yeah. declutter the mind? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's still like, um, I'll, I'll be sat there one day now and just think of a story that I couldn't think of. It's, it's yeah. weird how you body, your brain just forgets yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the book is, um, it's got stories in there. Mm. Um, you know, the book is all my experience from being in the situations and scenarios that I experienced during during my time in the special yeah. forces, in the military, and the climbing. Yeah. Um, and it's put in it's put into that book, so it's less an autobiography yeah, and more. Okay. Um, you know, it's the seven characteristics that I see go into being an elite level operator. Yeah, and you can take that and put it put it into whatever you want to. Yeah, put it into right absolutely. into sport, into business, yeah, absolutely, into, absolutely into life. Well, I think your acronym Soldier is perfect for entrepreneurs and business. Mm. Can you just talk us through Soldier? Yeah, sure. So S is self. So um, understanding yourself. So it starts with a personality test, and then it's you know for me that's one of the, the most important chapters. Yeah, I think that you know the more you can understand how you fit into the world and how you fit into say business or what makes you tick, yeah. or what doesn't make you tick the more you can get out of life, yeah. work and play. Um, O's opportunity, which for me has been something that I've looked to seek out through all my life, whether it's work, whether it's the expeditions, climbing. Um, so it's all, all about recognizing it when it comes in and um, how you take it and tune your body into being able to take it. Uh, L's leadership. So all the, the good parts of leadership, all the bad parts of leadership. Um, and how you can implement them into your life. Uh, D's danger. So not talking about danger in in terms of Everest or um, being in firefights, but you know the 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 reaction your body has from doing things that are difficult or things that you fear is exactly the same as being in a firefight or you know blowing up you know blowing a door and going into a building. It's the same reaction, right? So whether that's applying for a job that you don't think you're going to get or a job interview or coming on a podcast or starting a business venture, asking a girl or boy out. It's all the same reaction that your mm. body goes through. So that's put down in, in, in the danger chapter. Um, what are we on? I, eyes intelligence. So something that, again, I, I never started out to have intelligence. I'm not academic academically intelligent. But I think that special forces soldiers are probably some of the most intelligent people that I've ever met. And it's not so much academic intelligence, it's um, adaptability intelligence. So what happens when shit goes wrong? How do I adapt into that? Uh, and also emotional intelligence. So being able to work in a team, being able to communicate, have social skills. Um, e is excellence. So trying to do everything to the best that you can and, and live by that. Um, and then R's resilience. So, you know, resilience is potentially the biggest skill that anyone in the, in, in the military or especially the special forces should have. Um, but it's something that we all could benefit from, right? The world's an easy place to live in. We get up, we've, you know, food's accessible. We've got money on our bank. Yeah. We've got this four wheeled vehicle that drives us everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, just, you know, the world's an easy place and you know, there's a lot of bad that comes from that, right? Mm. So resilience is all about how do you bring resilience into your own life? So whether it's, you know, setting your alarm early or um, implementing a fitness regime, cold water, like I love cold water, yeah. getting up and jumping in a cold bin or, a, you know, the <laughs> sea. <laughs> getting up and jumping in a cold bin. <laughs> <rubber weapon. laughs> You're with your weapon. <laughs> What do you do? What do you what do you do? What do you do in the morning? Have you got a routine in the morning? Yeah, in the bin. It is, is it? Yeah, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Or the sea. Yeah. I do the sea sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like 
you know it's no different than probably anyone else's just get up I've, I've, i won't look at my phone until say half nine yeah um which i find helps right yeah because i can get so much done oh, in the morning oh, before i turn that phone yeah. on but then you need that phone right yeah. for so many different things yeah. uh so i'll leave the phone i'll get up you know get some cold water whether mm. it's a shower whether it's getting a cold bin mm. um <laughs> go, and then just do some exercise right? yeah. go for a walk or a run 100 percent um train so powerful breakfast. so simple but so powerful isn't it? exercise yeah yeah yeah. for your mind wow yeah for everything right everything uh clean yeah like i just i have to declutter the house yeah not because i've got ocd but i find if i just do that and yeah. then when i turn that phone over at 9 30 you're ready good to go for yeah, whatever i quality, need to do mate. Quality. this finish up here jay i thoroughly enjoyed you having on the show mate it's fascinating i'm absolutely fascinated by the whole thing i think you're doing amazing things your book respect is earned everyone should go and check it out and thanks for coming on the show mate cheers dodge you're a gentleman thank you Good night.